Bellasas. My name is Lucy Loizu and welcome to this week's Family Law Show brought to you by the International Family Law Group. I will be your host for this evening's programme. I am a family law solicitor at the firm specialising in work that has a financial element as well as those cases relating to children. Some of you may know me from the work that I do for London Greek Radio. Over the last few years I have been advising listeners in respect of their family law problems. I also write a column for the Barigiagi newspaper, as well as other Greek websites. As a firm, we provide a whole range of family law services for our clients both nationally and internationally. Today's programme will focus on the alternative ways of dealing with disputes other than going to court. Over the forthcoming weeks, we're going to be dealing with some other topics too, to include divorce, finances on divorce, children matters, if you want to relocate to another country with your child, some things to remember if you find yourself in the court process. Um, also, you know, we're going to be looking at what you can do. So back to today's show. I'm joined in the studio today by my colleague Denise Carter. Denise is a consultant at the International Family Law Group and she is a mediator with specific expertise in cases that have an international element that involve children. Denise worked and was the director for the organisation Reunite um, for over 20 years and I'm very proud to say that in the year 2000 Denise was um, awarded an OBE for all the hard work that she has done in relation to uh, international child abduction work. So Denise, thank you very much for joining us in the studio today. It's my pleasure. So the format of our show will be that we're going to um, have some answers and Denise is going to uh, have some questions and Denise is going to give us some answers to various questions which we'll ho we hope that you will find useful. So first of all Denise, um, clients often come to our offices and they want to avoid the lengthy court process mm -hmm. and expensive legal fees associated with that. Um, what are the alternative methods of resolving disputes without having to go to court? Well, certainly looking at the children's matters particularly, is that mediation now is proven to be highly successful. To give parents an opportunity to come together and put the court process just slightly to the side. So what they can do then is look at the best interests of the children and the dynamics of their family on what is the best way forward for them. And what does the mediation process entail? How does it work? Well, first of all, what we will do is have a chat to the parents separately to see whether mediation is an option for them. Anything that is spoken about within those sessions remains confidential. If they're both happy to move forward with the mediation, then what we are able to do then is set a mediation up. First of all, we look at whether it's sole mediation or whether they need a co-mediator. Particularly in the international cases, we would look at a co-mediated setting. Sometimes in these cases, there is already a court process started, particularly with the abduction cases or the relocation cases. We bring the parents together to give them an opportunity to speak openly and honestly about a way forward so that the children can maintain a positive relationship with both parents and, of course, the extended family members, which is vitally important. And, I mean, you deal with a lot of cases that have international elements, mm -hmm. specifically in respect of children. Um, are there any problems that you find in, in dealing with these types of cases because there's that international link? Yes, there are. Every case is different, of course, and every country that we deal with is different. For example, if we're dealing with an abduction case from the United States of America, in some of the states in the US it's a criminal offence, and there could be criminal charges pending against the parent that has allegedly abducted the child. So again, within the mediation process, can we mediate that? We would again need to work with the lawyers overseas to see whether those criminal charges would be dropped if the mother, if it was the mother that abducted the children, was to voluntarily return with the child. We often have to look at the issue of visas and immigration. We often find that some of the parents that have been living in America have overstayed their visas and their green cards haven't been sorted out because they've been at home caring for their children. In other countries there may be other matters, so it's important that we speak to the parents before we actually enter the process mm. to look at any of these barriers. If we're able to overcome those barriers, then we can actually start then the mediation. And is it a voluntary process or can you be compelled to mediate? 
In the international work we do, we look at it on a voluntary basis. And I think really when looking at sort of the history of mediation, if it's truly going to work, it's, people have got to engage with the process. Um, but I am dealing with a case where the court has actually ordered the parents to come to mediation because they believe it's in the best interest of the child. So every case is different and we have to tailor make the mediation to fit the clients and to fit their circumstances. Mm. And what do you think the benefits of mediation are in a case? Well, I think it takes away the battle of the courtroom. Um, we're already dealing with parents that are estranged or separated for whatever reason, so there's a conflict there already between the adults. If we then add the battle of the courtroom, any goodwill between those parents is gone. Mm. And how does that affect the child? Mm. It affects the child in a very negative way. It sees the two people that they love the most fighting over them. And for many of the children, they actually believe it's their fault on why their parents are fighting. So I think mediation gives parents an opportunity to stop, to think, to put the court process just on the side and then actually see how they can take it forward. And it's far better for the parents to make a decision about their children than sure. a judge. Sure. And in cases that you, you mediate in, does it cause a problem if one parent is in one country and another parent is, let's say in, in our case, we've got a parent in England and a parent in mm. Cyprus, can mediation still happen? Yes, it can. Ideally, it's better to have the parents in the same room so they're face to face, you've got the body language and it flows really nicely. But I do do a lot of work through Skype. And that has worked very well, um, particularly when looking at countries such as Egypt or the, some of the European states where parents haven't been able to travel easily and freely or may not be able to be in a financial position to cover those costs. So Skype, video conferencing are the types of tools that we use. And um, in mediation cases, what it, or not all cases are mm. suitable for mediation. Um, what types of cases may not be suitable? Well, looking at it, I think first of all, the parents have got to be open to the mediation process. If a parent is coming to say, well, I'm happy to mediate on the basis that this will happen, then clearly their mind is closed to that. Mm. Um, some cases where there has been heavy domestic violence, we may feel that there is a power imbalance between the parents and we're not able to, to work that. But again, in some of the cases I've dealt with, there's been quite a lot of domestic abuse and we have been able to mediate. And sometimes we can mediate those cases better through Skype or through shuttle mediation where the parents are in different rooms, but maybe within the same building. Mm. So we do have to consider what the options are. But the most important thing is for the parents to be open and willing to give it a try. Mm. And let's say um, court proceedings are necessary in England. Um, mm -hmm. Is there requ a requirement to mediate if one parent is living abroad, let's say? Well, at the moment, mediation is voluntary. So there isn't a, a, a push for it sort of through the courts. Um, but it's difficult to say. It depends on the individuals that, that are involved in the case. Mm. And... Um, We've, we've had a programme that talks about child abduction mm. and how that's a criminal offence, parental child abduction, etc. Um, surely, if you've got a case like that, you're not necessarily going to mediate it. Is that correct? No, I do a lot of mediation in international child abduction cases. Um, through the research that uh, was done many years ago, we do find that mediation does work well in those cases because there's so much to lose. And for the child, it's ongoing litigation. It's possibly the parents having to return. They go back to the country to which they've come from. It's further court proceedings, possibly for a relocation. Um, then the child is relocated back. Then there's an issue about contact and how the child is going to maintain contact with the family overseas again. So it's better to really come together and look at the whole picture going forward, breaking the elements down so the parents understand what they are facing if it goes through the court process. Mm -hmm. But I also think in those cases it's important that the mediation works hand in hand with the courts and with the specialist solicitors like the ones at International Family Law Group. Because if the child is travelling across international borders, then it's crucially important that that 
agreement is made into consent orders and registered under the European or international conventions. And why is it important that these kind of orders are registered? Because it safeguards the child to ensure that the child can maintain contact with both parents, both countries and both cultures. And of course, if one of the parents was not to comply with what was agreed, it means then the parent can go to the court to look at enforcement, which clearly is in the best interest of the child because it sees everybody within the child's family. Sure. And is mediation an expensive process? It does work out a lot cheaper than the courts in most cases. Um, it isn't cheap, but it isn't ex as expensive as going through the court. And I think it's about the emotional cost. Mm. The fact is that we often find, even in the mediations that we mediate, but don't get an agreement, the fact is that the parents have spoken in a calm, controlled environment, have been open and honest with each other. They actually can sometimes leave the mediation and make their own agreements that they can then take to their solicitors. I've never really had a case where a parent says that mediation was harmful mm. to them, their children, or moving forward with the decision. So I think mediation is always worth a try if you can do it. I agree. And I guess one of the other key things with mediation is picking a good mediator. Mm. Um, and ha I mean, that can be very difficult because people may be guided by cost, mm -hmm. they may be guided by locality. Um, how do you find a good mediator? Well, certainly in England and Wales, there are lists of, of mediators that you can go to. There's different professional bodies um, that we have to be members of um, to be accredited as mediators. So you can contact one of those bodies. Um, you can contact International Family Law Group. We have a mediation service there. If we can't deal with your case, then we could refer you on to a, a suitable mediation service. And of course, you've got the internet. And I think it's really important for anybody that's considering mediation is do the research, find the right service for you, look at the mediators involved in that service and make sure they have the expertise and knowledge that is needed for your particular situation. And a lot of agreements are reached in mediation, which is good for mm -hmm. all parties really. Um, let's say you, a clients reach a deal, um, is that binding? Until it goes to court, no. Right. It is a formal agreement between, say, you and I, we've made an agreement, but it isn't legally binding. So therefore, in domestic cases, it may be that you just have a parenting plan and there's no need to go to court. If it breaks down, then your solicitor can take that agreement to court and show the judge of where you'd got to. But certainly when there's a movement across a border or within the European states, I think it's very important to have that legal advice throughout the mediation process and make sure that you look at having it made into a consent order. Hmm. Or at least, for example, I had a case with Israel where neither parent wanted to have solicitors involved. I had to then go and get some specialist legal advice and we were able to put a paragraph in the agreement to say that both parents had agreed that they didn't want to go to have it made into a consent order. But if either one didn't apply, they were both happy for this written agreement between them to be put into court as yeah. evidence. Okay. So there are ways around that. Okay. And do you find that, um, the, I mean, you mediate, you're there with both parents mm -hmm. in the room, um, will they usually have their separate representation as well and they'll, they'll speak to their lawyers and then they'll come to mediation? Is that quite common? They will often have a lawyer already in place and the lawyer is aware that they are coming to mediation. And of course, the lawyers can also check out the expertise of the mediators involved. Throughout the mediation process, parents are able to stop and speak to their lawyers, both in the jurisdiction that they're mediating in it and the other jurisdiction. It's important that any parent making a decision within mediation is making an informed decision. Mm. And again, it's a duty of the mediators to make sure that parents are stopping, looking at the decision they're making, getting the information before they make that actual decision. So we have a lot of players within the mediation process. They may not be in the mediation room, but they are on the edges, so the parents can tap into that expertise. 
And is it the mediators or the lawyers that will draw up the con the consent order once an agreement is reached? It is the lawyers that will do that. Okay. The mediators um, know how and know how the consent orders work, so we know it has to be very clear and black and white. But we would set it down in a memorandum of understanding that would be emailed immediately to the lawyers after the mediation process. The parents would then speak to their lawyers about it, and the lawyers would then change that into a consent order which would go in front of the courts. In front of the courts. And let's say you have an unfortunate scenario where mediation isn't successful, mm -hmm. what happens then? Well if the mediation hasn't worked, it doesn't affect the legal process, they just revert back to the courts and then of course the lawyers will take it forward and then you will deal with it as, as, as if it's never been to mediation. Mm. And the discussions that are had in mediation, are they confidential? Can they be referred to in court proceedings if, if you go to court? Mm. No, anything within the mediation process remains confidential. The only time that we would break that confidence was if one of the parents um, talked about child abuse. And then we have a duty of care to the child to inform the relevant authorities so they can make the investigation to make sure that the child is safe and well. But no, we cannot be subpoenaed to court to give evidence or any information from the mediation process. Else it wouldn't work, because Quite. as people can't speak openly and honestly Quite. about the situation that they find. So it's purely on child protection matters, yes. Yeah. So it's like being in a, bu you know, a bubble, a safe, secure bubble, mm -hmm. that you can just be honest and, and frank. Absolutely, and many of the parents will say to me that they've spoken more openly and honestly with each other within mediation than they have done for many years. So it is a good process, and we all know we have to communicate with each other oh. and try and work out our differences. Particularly where you have you know, your types of cases where there are children involved, you've got mm. to work together as parents to, mm. you know, for the future. Absolutely, and of course the voice of the child also has to be taken mm. into account depending on the age of the child and the maturity of the child. And we often have children involved in the mediation itself. And talk us through that a bit more. I mean, I often get asked in client mm. meetings, my little boy doesn't want to go and see his dad mm. or, uh, you know, you know, things like that. Mm. What happens with the child? Are their voices heard? How old do they have mm. to be? How does that work? Well, in the mediation that I undertake, I would not necessarily see a child under the age of nine. Right. Um, if, if the child was under nine and we wanted to have the voice of the child, then we would bring in a specialist social worker who is trained to deal with the, a child of that age. Over that age, I am able to consult with children. So we try and find out the view of the children, how the children would like to see the future. What are the things that they would like to sort of talk to their mums and dads about? How they're going to see each other now that mum and dad aren't living together? And we're able to feed that information to the parents. Some of the older children may have their own legal representation and actually ask to be involved in the mediation process. Mm. So we'll come in for parts of the mediation where we're actually discussing that with the parents and that's very powerful because if the children say truly how they feel then hopefully the parents will take that on board. Quite and it, and it must be sort of at times a bit of an eye-opener for the parents hearing it from their child. I think so and actually they say out of the mouths of babes and sometimes the children are far more sort of responsible and adult about it than the children are yeah. and I think the children are often the way forward and it truly does help the parents mm. move the situation and in again, the best interest. they're in, a, in the bubble, the children are in that same mm -hmm. bubble of mediation so so hopefully they're, they're at ease as well and not feeling as though they're in the middle and going against mm. one parent or the other. Well that's right and there's different ways of showing the voice of the child. The children may wish us as a mediator to give information, they may write a letter, they may ask to, to just verbalise what they're saying. We don't have secrets with the children, but the children know that we're going to be honest with the parents. So there's different ways of feeding the voice of the child in and it's always in a way that the child is comfortable with. Mm. The child is the focal point of the mediation for me and the protection of that child is crucially important, either yes. through mediation or through the court, as you know, as a family solicitor. Sure. And we've talked to and focused on mediation. Mm. What other alternatives are there to going to court? Um, clients, we often advise our clients about a process called collaborative mm. law or arbitration. Mm. Can you tell our viewers a little bit more about both? Well, I think when looking at that, when looking at the collaborative law, it's about actually the clients and the lawyers working together to find that middle road. 
and that is often used more when property and finances are involved. And then the arbitration is to actually bring an arbitrator in to make a decision for you, which is going to work for both parties. If and then that can go to court. And at least then the judge understands that it has been looked at, it's been looked at fairly, there's been communication between the clients and the lawyers, a fair deal has been found, a middle road has been found, which should be then equal and fair to both parties. So alternative dispute resolution isn't just about children, it can be looked at in anything mm. from family law to commercial law, yes. uh, whatever. So mediation is about communication. Yes. You just have to find the right way for your particular situation. Right. And one thing I would say to our viewers is that um, Denise has been speaking about mediation in the context of um, children work, um, but mediation, collaborative law, arbitration, these alternative methods of resolving disputes um, can also be used for your divorce case, when you're dealing with finances, sometimes when you're dealing with um, you know, leave to remove cases, which means where you want to permanently relocate to another country with your child. So they can work for all types of family law cases and it's important to discuss these areas with your lawyer early on so that you know what the options are available to you because we're firm believers that court isn't the only answer. You know, there are ways that you can um, deal with cases that don't require you um, to have to go to court always. So, so do bear that in mind. Um, and just touching base mm. on the input that lawyers have, Denise, um, do you find that negotiations between lawyers are still being used as opposed to mediation or collaborative law or arbitration? Well, certainly in some of the cases that I work with, we do see the lawyers still working together. And I think that's vitally important that they do. It isn't about who's just winners and losers. Quite. These are people's lives. So I think any way that we can look at resolving the situation, and certainly I think for many, many years, lawyers have always worked together and tried to find a way of resolving cases. It's still happening now, and I think it should be encouraged. Mm. And I, I agree. I Good. agree. Denise, thank you very much. Um, I hope that our um, viewers have found this evening's programme helpful and informative. Um, as you know, both Denise and I work um, at the International Family Law Group and we're both able to advise and assist in any family law issues that um, may arise in relation to, to your case. So please feel free to give us a call. Um, our telephone number at the office is 0203 178 5668. Alternatively, please feel free to take a look at our website www.iflg.uk.com um, and we'll be pleased to help. Um, all that remains for me to say is thank you to Denise thank for you. joining us in the studio and uh, we look forward to um, you all tuning in again next week. Galinik dasas.